Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Thursday, April 22nd, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. NASA has generated oxygen on Mars. The story of the women retirees who hacked the stock market decades before GameStop and Wall Street bets. And on the eve of his 404th death day, a look at what Shakespeare can teach us about living through pandemics. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Oxygen has been generated on Mars. Moxie, not the New England soda or great new Amy Poehler film on Netflix, but an instrument on NASA's Perseverance rover, which stands for Mars Oxygen in Situ Resource Utilization Experiment, Moxie successfully produced oxygen from carbon dioxide in the Martian atmosphere. Quoting NASA, Mars's atmosphere is 96% carbon dioxide. MOXIE works by separating oxygen atoms from carbon dioxide molecules, which are made up of one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. A waste product, carbon monoxide, is emitted into the Martian atmosphere. The conversion process requires high levels of heat to reach a temperature of approximately 1,470 degrees Fahrenheit, or 800 degrees Celsius. To accommodate this, the MOXIE unit is made with heat-tolerant materials. These include 3D-printed nickel alloy parts, which heat and cool the gases flowing through it, and a lightweight aerogel that helps hold in the heat. A thin gold coating on the outside of MOXIE reflects infrared heat, keeping it from radiating outward and potentially damaging other parts of Perseverance. End quote. And from Space.com, quote, The MOXIE team warmed the instrument up for two hours yesterday, then had it crank out oxygen for an hour. MOXIE produced 5.4 grams of oxygen during that span, about enough to keep an astronaut breathing easily for 10 minutes, NASA officials said. That first effort didn't max MOXIE out. It can generate about 10 grams of oxygen per hour. The instrument may reach such levels eventually, for the team plans to conduct about nine more runs over the course of one Mars year, about 687 Earth days, end quote. Now, MOXIE itself would not be able to provide enough oxygen for astronauts on Mars, but larger successors could, theoretically. And quoting once more from NASA, MOXIE isn't just the first instrument to produce oxygen on another world, said Trudy Cortez, director of technology demonstrations within STMD. It's the first technology of its kind that will help future missions live off the land using elements of another world's environment. End quote. With everything going on with stocks being memefied this year, and the antics of the Wall Street Bets subreddit and GameStop and all that, I found this little ripple from recent history absolutely awesome. So before disillusioned Wall Street bros tried to hack the system and punitively bring power to the people, another group of unlikely investors teamed up to get a piece of the pie themselves. A group of 16 women, mostly retired seniors, known as the Beardstown Ladies. The Hustle recently recounted the women's rise and fall in the 1980s, and honestly, I'd say even their fall from grace wasn't that bad, but we'll get to that. Theirs is mostly a story of women deciding to claim their space in a sector that had historically discounted them. So in the early 80s, Betty Sinock, a bank teller in Beardstown, Illinois, decided she wanted to buy some stocks. She kept seeing customers drop off substantial dividend checks and wanted to get in on that. But she didn't know too much about investing and had trouble finding a broker because, as she put it, none of them wanted to deal with an old lady. So she teamed up with another woman facing the same challenge, Shirley Gross. The two of them got together other interested women in the town and founded the Beardstown Business and Professional Women's Investment Club. Many of the women were retired, the youngest just 41, and the oldest 87. Some were teachers, some small business owners, others were farmers and homemakers. Hardly any of them had experience in the stock market, but they met together once a week to learn together, swapping tips and resources as they snacked on Doritos and drank Pepsi. After starting meetings with a poem, they would discuss which stocks to buy with their pooled funds. Each woman had paid $100 at the start and contributed $25 a month in dues. Quoting The Hustle, the club's process for identifying good stocks was a mixture of intuition, research, and good old-fashioned legwork. As self-proclaimed fundamentalists, or value investors, they gravitated towards stocks they felt were underestimated by the market. They'd call up CEOs and pour over publications from investment research firm ValueLine, selecting stocks that fit several criteria. 
The stock price had to be under $25 per share. The stock had to have at least five years of solid growth. The company had to be in one of the 25 largest industries. The company had to have debts less than a third of its assets. The company had to have a strong track record of leadership. No vice stocks, tobacco, liquor, gambling. But their analysis went beyond the numbers. Sometimes they just pick what felt right based on observation. They bought into the shoemaker Wolverine Worldwide because they simply liked the durability of the company's boots. Hershey's was selected because the ladies saw promise in Kiss Chocolates. End quote. And I love this detail. One Wall Street dude once criticized them for buying Walmart stock, and club co-founder Shirley Gross responded with, Every time I go there, it's packed with people. Have you ever been inside a Walmart? End quote. And of course, he hadn't. Some of their other investments included McDonald's, Cracker Barrel, Rubbermaid, Quaker Oats, Century Telephone, Home Depot, and St. Jude Medical. By the early 90s, the Beardstown ladies were doing pretty well. Their initial $1,600 investment was now at more than $80,000, and the National Association of Investment Clubs had given them an all-star rating five years in a row. And it was around then that the media caught on and things really blew up. And this is where it gets a bit sticky. CBS This Morning had them on and wanted a number for the club's returns, but they hadn't been tracking them, so they rushed to get the network a number after being pushed. They said their average annual investment return was 23.4%, aka more than twice as much as the S&P 500 during the same years. That astronomical figure made them overnight stars. They appeared on more shows, spoke at conferences, and published a book that spent three months on the New York Times bestseller list. But eventually, with so many eyes on them, someone finally did some digging on that outsized returns figure. An independent audit showed their actual return was just 9.1%. Not very impressive whatsoever. The club eventually said the error was due to some investment software and that they'd accidentally included revenue from other projects in the calculation. The media tried to run a bunch of negative press on them, and their publisher was even sued over what were considered false claims on the parts of the Beardstown ladies. But in general, the American public wasn't too upset. Even if they weren't miraculous investing geniuses, they still upended a lot of people's assumptions about the kind of person who played the stock market, and encouraged a lot more women to finally join in. According to The Hustle, by 1997, 47% of all American women were now investing in stocks, compared to just 44% of men. And between the year of the Beardstown Ladies' founding in 1983 and 1997, The Hustle also notes that the number of national investment clubs rose from 7,000 to 28,000, in large part thanks to that huge increase in women investors. People who don't fit the stereotypical look of an investor saw how the market could be accessible to them and how they could lean on each other as a community for support. And that's what I think is really great about this story. You know, Shirley Chisholm used to say, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. And that's what the Beardstown ladies did. And while Wall Street is anything but diverse, they did help inspire a lot of people to get involved who may not have felt welcome before. And the Beardstown Ladies Club still exists. Most of the founding members have, of course, passed away, but there are new members running the show, and today, their portfolio is worth over $500,000. Good for them. So tomorrow, April 23rd, is Shakespeare's birthday and his death day. At least we celebrate them as such. All we really know is that William Shakespeare was christened on April 26th, 1564, but various customs give scholars reason to believe his actual date of birth was probably April 23rd. Of course, that was all on the Julian calendar, so if we really wanted to translate it to the Gregorian calendar, his birth date is probably more like May 3rd. But anyways, we celebrate April 23rd as his birthday, and in many countries it's also celebrated as World Book Day, a day created by the UN to promote reading. And in honor of the birth of the bard, I wanted to revisit a New York Times op-ed from March of last year from Oxford Shakespeare scholar Emma Smith about what Shakespeare can teach us about living during a pandemic. Now, this time last year, as lockdowns continued on throughout the world, there was a very frustrating hustle culture narrative about how we should all be using this time of not going out recreationally to achieve great things, learn an instrument or a new language, write the great American novel. 
I mean, after all, so many people kept pointing out Shakespeare wrote King Lear when the theaters were closed during an outbreak of the plague. So what have you done? Well, a few notes on that. First, Shakespeare was Shakespeare. I mean, I'm not saying you can't be as talented as Shakespeare, but dude was a bit of a genius. And also, by 1606, when he wrote King Lear, he was well-established at his craft. Telling someone to use lockdown to achieve something great for the first time is very different from someone who had already written several successful plays and poems at that point. Plus, he was rich. By 1606, he'd made several smart investments. He'd been able to afford to purchase a coat of arms for his family, making him and any of his progeny gentlemen in perpetuity. And his theater troupe had recently been given patronage by the newly coronated King James. So not only did he have the funds to be writing, and the funds to escape the plague in London to the more peaceful Stratford, where he had a wife and probably servants to take care of his house and the kids, but it was literally his job to be writing plays. So trying to tell someone who's spending eight hours a day remote working that they should use their lockdown evenings to write the next King Lear when they've never written something on that scale before is just a completely mismatched comparison. And another point, as Smith points out in the New York Times, shutting things down due to the plague was fairly common. It was something that happened repeatedly throughout Shakespeare's time. That doesn't mean that it didn't weigh heavily on him, but it wasn't nearly as traumatic as it has been for many of us for whom this concept was just completely out of left field. He didn't have to expend as much mental and emotional energy coping with the shock of it. That said, the ever-present specter of the plague did cast a shadow on Shakespeare and everyone living in the Elizabethan and Jacobian eras, especially in London. What's interesting about Shakespeare, though, is that not a single character in any of his surviving works dies of the plague. Quoting Smith in The Times, Men and women, to be sure, die in any number of inventive ways. In Othello, Desdemona is smothered in her bed. In Titus Andronicus, the rapists Chiron and Demetrius have their throats cut and are baked into pastry. John of Gaunt dies of old age, exacerbated by the absence of his exiled son in Richard II. In Hamlet, Ophelia drowns. But no one in Shakespeare's plays dies of the plague. Romeo and Juliet, who die because the friar's letter is held up by quarantine measures in northern Italy, are the nearest his work comes to plague fatalities. Just as Shakespeare never set a play in contemporary London, neither did he address directly the most prominent cause of sudden death in his society. End quote. And it really was a harsh time of plague. As Bill Bryson succinctly describes it in his biography of the Bard, quote, William Shakespeare was born into a world that was short of people and struggled to keep those it had, end quote. The population of London when Shakespeare was born in 1564 was substantially less than it had been three centuries prior, around the time the plague first started rearing its ugly head. And yet, unlike some of his contemporaries, Shakespeare didn't tend to address real-world local issues in a direct manner. But that doesn't mean they weren't addressed. For example, especially while Queen Elizabeth was on the throne, his plays are rife with matters of succession, as the nation waited on bated breath expecting all-out war to break out when the childless Elizabeth died. And as far as the plague goes, Smith makes the argument that the effects of the plague on society and on individuals is evident across Shakespeare's works, even if he barely ever mentions it by name. Quoting again, Death cares about our particularity enough to stalk us as we go about our daily business. Shakespeare's tragedies share this intimacy. Their response to plague is not to deny mortality, but rather to emphasize people's unique and inerasable difference. Elaborate plots, motives, interactions, and obscurities focus our attention on human beings. No one in Shakespeare's plays dies quickly and obscurely thrown into a communal grave. Rather, last words are given full hearing. Epitaphs are soberly delivered. Bodies taken off stage respectfully. Shakespeare is not interested in the statistics, what in his time were called the bills of mortality. His fictions reimagine the macro narrative of epidemic as the micro narrative of tragedy, setting humane uniqueness against the disease's obliterating ravages. His work is a cultural prophylactic against understanding disease solely in quantitative terms, a narrative vaccine. End quote. 
I bring this all up not just because tomorrow is Shakespeare's birthday and I always want an excuse to rant about King Lear, but because one thing I've been curious about for the last year is how this period of time will be reflected in art. Personally, I don't think I want to see movies and TV shows explicitly addressing what it was like to live in lockdown in a documentary style. It's too much. But I would like to see stories that hit on the emotions we've felt, the deeper themes that resonated with us, the ways that we've been changed by this time, or the change we would now like to see. And even though our experience with coronavirus is not a one-to-one -one comparison to the plague, maybe this lens will serve as a new window into Shakespeare's plays for some of us. We can read some of his texts with a new appreciation for the fears and the reckoning with death that are presented so palpably in his plays. I'll leave you with this quote Smith shares from King Lear when the monarch realizes that he's been too short-sighted in not caring about others. A sort of overdue checking of privilege I think we've seen in a ton of people this past year. You could say this is King Lear posting a black square on Instagram. Quote, Poor naked wretches wheresoever you are that bide the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides, your looped and windowed raggedness defend you from seasons such as these? Oh, I have taken too little care of this. End quote. So I tweeted this one out this morning, but coming on September 28th is a hulking trade paperback from Quirk Books that is compiling the four Avengers films, so the Avengers, Age of Ultron, Infinity War, and Endgame, but written as if by Shakespeare. So for Marvel comic book fans, just imagine if every character were written like Thor. Quirk Books is the publisher behind Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, as well as a whole slew of Shakespeare-style movie-to-book adaptations, including for several Star Wars films and Back to the Future, all written by Ian Desher. So this project is very in line with stuff they've already been doing, but, I mean, The Avengers is great for Shakespeare. I often compare the perpetual rebooting of superhero movies as comparable to Shakespeare and his contemporaries riffing on well-known existing stories, putting the same actors into the same archetypal roles, or having characters appear in multiple plays. You know, we might think of it as uncreative in our post-copyright, post-blockbuster boom era, but it's really closer to how storytelling has always been done. But that's a rant for another day. For now, I just wanted to recommend this maybe, hopefully, pretty fun comic coming out this fall. And that is it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow.